There are three important points to know about the Sermon on the Mount. Firstly, the sermon was never actually delivered on a mountain. Secondly, the discourse was never actually a sermon. And thirdly, the words were never actually spoken by Jesus. These are not the assertions of a sceptical atheist. They are the consensus opinion of New Testament scholarship and have been for a long time. A moment's thought will tell you that no one could have recorded the sermon at the time on what, with what, or remembered an actual speech so accurately afterwards. Orthodox opinion holds that Matthew assembled the material from a whole bunch of Jesus' pronouncements and presented them as a single sermon for convenience sake or literary style whereas his co-evangelist, Luke, presented some of the same ideas as a shorter Sermon on the Plain and dropped other bits here and there throughout his own Gospel. Either way, it's an admission that what we are dealing with here is a fiction. There really wasn't any Sermon on the Mount. It's worth noting that it requires barely 15 minutes to read the sermon, hardly worth the climb up a mountain, but suggestive of a huge amount of careful selection and editing of a supposed sermon. Even the setting is odd. At first, Jesus appears to be sitting with his disciples, so why has he gone up a mountain, seemingly to escape the crowds? But when the discourse ends, it is not the disciples, but the crowds who are astonished. Hence the confusing variety of images from artists who have attempted depictions of the scene, both intimately with Jesus and his disciples, and yet also Jesus in the presence of the multitude. Although the mix of blessings, aphorism, prayer and exhortations that follow is chaotic, it has clearly taken time and effort to extract this material from a range of Jewish scriptural sources. But it is scripture and not a flesh and blood Jesus that is the source of this so-called sermon. Foul not to be with them that weep, and mourn with them that mourn. Blessed is he who does not serve a man less worthy than himself. Turn away your eye from a beautiful woman, and do not look upon another's beauty. Are these the words of Jesus of Nazareth? Actually, no. But they are the words of a Jesus, Jesus, son of Sirach, author of the book called The Wisdom of Sirach, or Ecclesiasticus. Now, this book forms part of Jewish wisdom literature. Unlike the Gospels, Sirach, one of the longest books in the Bible, was signed by its author and dated by reference to the Egyptian pharaoh of his own time. It predates the Christian Gospels by more than 200 years and form part of the Septuagint, that version of Jewish scripture translated into Greek and used by the Gospel writers in concocting their tale of Jesus. For that reason, Sirach was rejected for the Jewish canon and doesn't show up in Protestant Bibles. Compared to the wisdom of Sirach, the so-called Sermon on the Mount is a lacklustre praise, neither profound nor original. Like Moses from Mount Sinai delivering the Ten Commandments, Jesus begins with his own decalogue, nine blessings and an exaltation. Here we have an echo not only of Sirach, but of the Jewish prophet Isaiah. The poor in spirit, the meek, those who mourn, those hungry for righteousness, all these are to be found in Isaiah. For the pure in heart, look no further than the first verse of Psalm 73. These so-called Beatitudes were followed by another decalogue of exhortations, often grouped into six so-called antitheses, introduced by the formula, You have heard it said, but I say. The followers of Jesus are to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, or you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Not just murder, but anger itself is liable to divine judgment. Not just the act of adultery, but looking lustfully. And divorce itself are sins. 
Loving neighbours isn't enough. Enemies are to be loved too. Beggars and borrowers are never to be refused. Oaths are never to be sworn. Cheeks are always to be turned. These impossible and frankly ridiculous requirements vex and frustrate the most determined of Christians. At the end of it all, Christians are exalted to be perfect, just like their Heavenly Father. Yet neither Jesus nor God himself can live up to these absolute and insane dictates. Routinely venting rage towards enemies and all who fail to humble themselves or who show any independence of thought. Even within the so-called sermon there are contradictions. At one point followers are the light of the world, urged to let their good works shine before others. But shortly after they are cautioned to give alms and practice piety in secret, unlike the hypocrites in the synagogue. Calling others foolish is condemned, yet Jesus does just that himself. At one point it seems everyone who seeks will find, and for everyone who knocks the door will be opened, and yet also that the gate is narrow and few will find it. The idea that the teachings of Jesus are sublime is patent nonsense. In this primitive and embittered world view, all discernment is lost. There are only good trees with good fruit and bad trees with bad fruit. Never a real tree that produces mainly good fruit, but some bad fruit. Everything is black and white, no shades of grey. Even the faithful are liable to condemnation on Judgment Day. Christians will often discount the importance of the historical narrative of the Gospel tale and argue that it isn't facts that matter, but the message of Jesus, all that love, peace and meekness that they suppose came from the lips of Jesus and made a remarkable innovation in human thought and ethics. Sadly, there is absolutely no truth in that naive notion.